Before I start, uh, I, I really like the previous presentation, and there's a, a very particular thing I want to just bring back from it. When Andres was saying undefined behavior, we who know about security, we're actually reading security problem. And specifically, the three cases he showed of free being used twice on the same pointer, or a pointer that's used after it's been free, or calling free with a pointer that was not the answer from a malloc, those are very well known on security problems. So it's, for us, it's not really an undefined behavior. And really, it may format your hard drive, for us it's a reality, because there might be an attacker who may be abusing that to format your hard drive. So. Undefined behavior and a crash, when you look at it from the security point of view, is actually a lot more dangerous than just undefined behavior. So now, let's start. Um, for, for the last lots of years, I've been doing security. I, I think it's more than, than 15 years. Working, like professionally working on security. And... Pretty much for the same time, I'd be doing a small talk as a hobby on the side. And finally, I could put both subjects together on the same presentation, so I'm really showing it. And my, my point here that I want to, I want actually to transmit two things. But one is that there's a lot about security that we, the small talkers, don't know, don't care by not knowing, and should care. And in this presentation, I'm only going to focus on VM problems. But there are a lot more. Like, for example, I should have started to bring your attention to web application security problems in Smalltalk, like Seaside and any framework. But I chose this one because I like it better. So... Have you ever wondered if your application needs security? I mean, we are all programmers. And we hope what we do will be used by somebody. So we will be running our code on somebody's box. And that may put in danger this somebody, our customer. So you as somebody delivering application to your customers, have you ever thought if your application needs security? Well, go back to that, because if you haven't, uh, you should. And those of you who have thought that your application may need some security, have you done anything about it? So if you haven't, and you knew, you are putting your customers in danger knowingly, you could say. So let's dive into our subject a little bit deeper. Um, we like to think that Java 2 is a better virtual machine and it's almost there to get what a small talk has been for 20 years. And we love to think that we've been doing it for a lot, lot of time and they're about to get there. And .NET is pretty new and we like to think that we're much better as small talkers. And uh, now... Chrome by Google has a VM that's pretty good. It's not like some amateurs did it. It's like people who really know about what they're doing did it. So, and Flash that we all know is also a very good VM at the bottom. All these VMs do not run 
an interpreter, they run native code. And uh, what's more important, more important from my point of view is that although we've been there for a lot of time, in security, we, we don't even qualify to compete. It's like, Smalltalk has ever done anything about security at a VM level. I'm exaggerating a little bit. Uh, there is Shemson and some other maybe small examples, but VisualWorks, Visual Studio, uh, Squeak, Dolphin, I bet, and I don't know, just throw a name. There is nothing specific for security, and security is really not something you can, well, you could, but it's not something you can actually add to a program, but you should actually think about it since you start. Because otherwise, you, can, you have to go back and change it all. And remember, I'm talking more about VMs, OK? We, we can go on different subjects. So I want to bring your attention to this fact that in security, we are lagging behind any other VM out there. And I want to convince you about that. So I'm going to show you examples. Um, for those of you who saw this presentation at ISUG, I added more. I, I had a, I didn't have enough time at ISUG, and I added more stuff at the end today. So I'm going to skip things so I can show you what's at the end. Um, however, there is a video of the ISUG presentation if you are interested in seeing what I'm skipping. So the scenario is very important to understand. Is I'm. I'm so you can understand what I'm thinking is a scenario where they, there is mobile code traveling from one machine to the other and executing in another machine. So it's a developer does something and it's executed somewhere else. That's pretty much the case always with standard applications, but it's more interesting in the in the if you think if we think if if we have in mind Flash and Java, and uh, .NET, and Chrome with JavaScript. Chrome, I'm, I'm saying Chrome, and I actually mean it's JavaScript VM. So the scenario is where, in some idea world, we can develop small talk applications that are shipped to other computer and run. For example, suppose Croquette, this 3D environment, does not lo only let you share objects, but also behavior attached to the objects. So if there's behavior traveling from one computer to the other, this is the scenario I'm going to exploit. OK? And so you picture something very com concrete. I'm thinking the attacker is very delicately coding a small talk application to steal your stored passwords in your hard drive. OK? So um, as I said, I'm going to talk about VMs, and I'm going to show you security problems on today one particular small talk VM. It's a very old small talk VM. It's visual, visual small talk VM. At ISU, I also show examples of visual works VM. It's pretty much the same examples. For one example in Vicious, World, Vicious Small Talk, I had one in Syncom. Today I'm going to skip Vicious Works, Syncoms, because I want to show what's at the end. Um, but to understand this, we need to go deep, I'm sorry, a little bit into assembly, because that's where the pro problems arise and can be exploited. So, one particular detail of this VM and syncoms and uh, many others is that the Smalltalk stack, the stack that's used to pass arguments and the stack that's used to save the return address from message sent, is stored in the native stack. That means that actually a push, a bytecode push in Smalltalk is translated to an assembly instruction push. So when I'm manipulating the small talk stack, I'm actually also manipulating the native stack. This, this is very interesting if we want to think on how 
FFI is implemented, uh, if you follow the whole chain with an FFI, you have a Smalltalk stack and then a native stack in the middle. And maybe if you have a callback, you go back to Smalltalk stack. So it's all one stack, one stack. And if you ha somehow can manipulate the native stack, there, there, there is something very particular you can do, and it's change the return address. We're going to go back to this. And if you change the return address, you can change the execution flow of the application. And in an attacker's mind, that means executing whatever you want to execute, arbitrary code, taking the computer, pretty much. So three particular uh, characteristics of this VM. The small text stack is the native stack. Same thing for syncoms, although syncoms has many native stacks, for one for each process. Andres, if I'm lying, don't let me do it. Um, another very interesting feature is that instance variables that today modern small talks has have uh, objects store objects as direct pointers, and that means pretty much that instance variables are accessed directly, taking this pointer and dereferencing it. So if I could trick the VM to think that an arbitrary number is actually an object. I could access arbitrary men memory. I'm going to come back to this. But wh what I mean here is that whenever I'm accessing an instance variable, there is no check to see if this instance variable, for example, is within the bounds of the object. So I could access memory that's outside the object just by tweaking the bytecode. And now maybe you can get some ideas on what, where I'm going. And what I was saying is that a push, here you can see the, can you see the mouse? Yeah. Here you can see the bytecode, so a push in, a bytecode push is translated into an assembly push. A push instance is translated into a push, accessing directly into memory. This is an argument, and so on. This is a send. Okay? And same thing for syncom. It's a little bit different, but it's pretty much the same. A push is a push. So, to start with, I wanted to understand the VM. I wanted to understand Visual, Small, Visual Smalltalk's VM. It's a Digitalk's VM, actually. It's very old. It's been there for, once, for a while. It's very stable. And it's very simple. I don't want to start with the biggest VM. I want to understand this one. And I'm interested in security. So I want to see how actually things are done at the lower level, the lowest level probably, and uh, see if I can find any problems, and then go further. So one of the things, whoops, what was that? An error, I guess. Let's start again. One, th one thing we added uh, is the ability to disassemble how a native method is, uh, how a method is nativized. So that means I don't have solutions? Uh, what was that? Oh, well, never mind. No, yes, mind. Mm. Mm. What was that? So, let's see. Mm. Let, let me try another one. I don't know why. We're having that. Okay. So, okay. Any idea? Anybody? No, I know what it is. It's, yeah, it's, it's that I saved the image, actually. And I'm using a library outside. But it doesn't matter, actually. Because what I want to show you is that this is how you usually see a method. Um, Leandro, a while ago, added the ability to see the bytecodes. In most small talks, you can do that. 
And then to do what I wanted to do, I added the ability to disassemble the method and see how it looks in assembly. Uh, so this is what I was showing you. Okay. But then after that, uh, actually for the presentation at ISUC, uh, I made a different tool, and it's this one. It's a it's a bytecode compiler. I want to write. I want to actually manipulate the assembly by writing uh, bytecodes. So, for example, I know that mo that the translation for, for, from bytecode to assembly is straightforward. So, pretty much, I can I can write assembly. Like push small integer one, it gets there. Let me use nativized to push three because integers are tagged in this view. Or I can push argument uh, mm, one, and it gets translated here. You see it. So I can start playing by, for example, push. Uh, or argument, argument one, and push argument one, push argument one, and if I want, if I actually wanted to execute this method, all I have to do is create a compile method with these bytes, with these bytecodes manually. It would be like byte array new at one, put this at one, at two, put this other thing, and that said. You have a question? Uh, and and uh, if you have a questions anytime, any, a question anytime, just ask me. Uh, if it's a Spanish, I'll translate it. And so I can create arbitrary methods and arbitrary assembly by writing small talk. Uh, so as I said, the native stack is a small talk stack. So let's see what we can do with that. Okay, first, I started listing and trying to understand what each bytecode gets trans translated to. There is a push R that's translated always to push EAX in Intel assembly, and I, I built a mapping of all the the little, the tiny little bits of assembly I can use to create my special compile method. Okay. I can push arbitrary things to the stack. I, yeah, I can, I can store a temporary. Let's do that. Mm, where is it? Yeah. Store, oh, no, here. Store tempo, temporary one. You see it's arbitrary negative index from the frame pointer. And it doesn't matter what I put here, it keeps going. No matter if I have that many temporaries. And you can already see that this is kind of weird. This method, no matter it does not have any temporary variable, lets me, ch let, lets me change an arbitrary number, an arbitrary memory position, relative memory position from the frame pointer. That's pretty much random access to the stack that's breaking an invariant. I can access the stack even out of bounds. So this is what I'm looking at, what, I, what it's selected there. So I can say temporary 1,000, and it changes the index. And if you know assembly, it, mean, it means writing into the stack. So already I'm corrupting the stack, and that's bad. Uh, this is, what was that? Undefined behavior. <laughs> well, well, yes, a little, well, not really. But let's go a little bit to what Stefan said today, early. He said, I want to have a web application where kids can come 
and safely write the code they want to code, the, the code they want, and I want to evaluate that. In that scenario, this is this is dangerous. In the other scenario, I was trying to explain. Imagine a small talk is as big as Java, or a Flash, or just for a second, okay? And so Java code travels compiled from the developer to the user running it. So does Flash. And if Smalltalk did compile, it means a frozen, let me say, uh, serialized compile method, in that context, this is a security problem. So if Croquet had behavior traveling with objects, as they want to do, maybe if the behavior travels as serialized, compile methods, then this is a problem. Okay, today, sadly, as a small talk, it's not so much used in the connected world. We don't have a real threat. And actually, that's an advantage in our side because we can probably put security features before we hit the actual problems. But we need to start caring about it. So, let's go back here. So, Yes, I can actually pop from the stack more than there is. It doesn't matter. I can actually even drop things from the stack. That means arbitrary, oh yeah, that's a bug, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. arbitrary changing what's in the stack, just drop things. That's going to break the invariant that the stack is uh, something, yeah. Balance, yeah, thank you. <laughs> and, yeah. And, however, in this particular case, which is not minor, I can manipulate the stack here by dropping things from top of it, but before returning, you see the return starts here. So all this is a return. The stack pointer is restored to, this, to the value which was saved on entry here. This is the prologue of the native function, and this is the epilogue. But for leaf nodes, for leaf methods, this particular small to has no frame prologue. Yeah. Prologue. Yeah. So then... As this means the method is too small to waste time saving the stack pointer. So now I can freely, arbitrarily push things into the stack and then return to it. That means pushing something on top of the stack and then returning, or what's equivalent, champing to what I just pushed. If 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 I did small integer one, and if I did this, push a small integer, and then return, the, let's actually, is this going to work? Install this method and crash the system. Uh, here I attach a debugger, and you can see the instruction that's being executed is instruction at address 3. And it absolutely makes sense, because I push a small integer 1, that's 1, tagged is 3, and return. So I can arbitrarily jump to 3. That's not so funny, but we can do better. Three is address where, no, no, it's address three. There's nothing there, actually. But it's because I push a small integer one, right? Mm. But we can do a little bit better. We can actually do, we can actually do a function, uh, a method, sorry, 
that wheel. Remember we did, we did uh, push one, return. So what happens if I push the argument and return? It means it's going to return to the, to the, the object that's, that's passed as argument. But I also say that in most modern small talks, objects are actually direct pointers. So it means it's going to shunt to the data of the object. So if I pass an argument as a byte array, it's going to push the address of the bytes and return to it. Um, if you have questions, go ahead. So this different example is going to push an argument and return. Okay? Push and return. And if you can see, this one does not does not abuse the no frame prolog uh, thing that I used before. The no frame prolog that simplifies a lot the method is not using it. So that that means I don't really need that particular bytecode to exploit this. What I do is I first drop things from the stack until I get to the return address, and then I push over the return address. And then I return, letting the method fix the stack pointer, like this. No, I need to change that, OK? Um, I drop things from the stack and pop the return address into the register EAX. I, I save the return address into EAX. And then I push the argument and then let everything return to that pointer. So let's see what happens now in the debugger. Uh, when I send that message, for example, that's you saw it's uh, execute, and here I'm calling it with a byte array. This is an idiom to create byte, byte arrays. And this is assembly code, actually. This is going to be a breakpoint, and this is going to be champ EAX. And why? Because if you remember, I here first pop re the return address into EAX. So I have the, return, the original return address. And since, since I can execute any assembly code, I can jump to AX and let everything continue. So let's do it. So here I have the, that's the breakpoint. And this is the jump EAX. And if I actually see what's in EAX, um, that should be code. And it, it should actually be the return address. So let's see what's there as code. We should see the prologue of a method, probably. I'm not too good today. So here you see it. It's the prologue of a method. And actually, if I take a look a little bit below it, I see the call. That's a message sent. So I now can continue. And small talk is still alive. Okay, it means, and I can do the same with. Uh, I can do the same, just the same with Syncons VM. And um, this is our, these are the only two I tried. But it's quite probably that if the native stack is mapped to the if the small stack is mapped to the native stack, there is going to be a trick to, like this. Um, in, yeah, different ways to do the same. In, in this, uh, if you see at, at the end, this return in, in assembly says how many bytes to pop from the stack. And, and that that's because the calling convention from, for Smalltalk is the, the colleague cleans the stack. So it means that if there is going to be, a, if the message has one argument, it's going to clean four bytes from the stack, one 32 bits worth. And if it has two arguments, I think this doesn't work. Oh, yeah. If it has three arguments, it's going to clean more. 
And if it has more, it cleans more and more. And, uh, and nothing prevents me from just doing a compile method, uh, changing the argument, the number of arguments on the compile method. And with that, I can also unbalance the, the stack and take advantage of it to jump to an arbitrary address. And this is actually, I think, the trick I use to escape Syncons VM. VM. Okay. Um, so again, what's the scenario? I think it's pretty clear by now. There, for these attacks to be successful, there's half, there, there has to be mobile code. Okay. And, uh, but there are many different ways of mobile code. Well, just one small detail, one small detail. I can execute arbitrary assembly code. For you, programmers, I assume that means I can do whatever I want, right? A C program is at the end assembly, and any other program is at the end assembly. So it means that by executing assembly, I can do whatever I want, right? Like maybe open a window, uh, remove the hard drive, open a connection, install an application, like whatever. Any program is at the end assembly. So, so what do you do, what can we do to deal with this? Certainly we need to put more security in the VM. Will that have a speed penalty? Quite probably, yes. But it's either that, or we lose all our information, or we can't compete in the market with Java, .NET, uh, Chrome, Flash. Because Java, .NET, Chrome, and Flash do actually care about security. And even when they may use the same, the native stack for the language stack, they don't let you unbalance the stack arbitrarily, for example. So there are, there might be more, but I think there are at least three ways to go about security in a VM environment. One is through reachability. So if I cannot reach the file class, then I can't open files. That's pretty straightforward, unless there's another way to open files, right? And unless I forgot one way to reach the, the file class, like in a very, in a highly re reflexive language where you can do class all instances, it's very hard to cut what you can access. Of course, you can do it. For example, Newspeak is uh, going in that direction. But I want you to understand that it needs to be implemented at the VM level. It can't be implemented in the language itself, as far as I understand it. So another very interesting way to go about security is sandboxing. Um, to say one way, in the VM, when we have an, when we have something running inside the VM, there is a very clear frontier between the virtual world and the real world, the inside and the outside of the VM, and that's that frontier is where you can put all the security checks. And if you don't, if 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 you take care of every uh, bridge from the inner world to the out, outer world and actually check the arguments for file open or socket connect or any other thing that is dangerous, you can control what the primitives lets the user do. And this is known as sandboxing, and it is implemented in, uh, in most VMs, in Java and .NET and Flash, for example, uh, you can code in any, of, in any of these languages, you can code, 
an application that connects to a remote host, but most environments don't let you connect unless the IP of the host you want to connect is the same IP from where the application was downloaded. So you download the application from one site, and you can only connect to that one. So you, you, it, it, this is kind of a security measure, so an attacker cannot use your computer to bounce to other computers, for example. And uh, checking files, for example, you don't let the user access, or you let the user access this file, but don't let the user access anything outside the temporary directory. Of course, you have to be very careful, and it's very hard to do every check you have to do, at least in the first time. But it's another interesting way to go. But I want you to understand that even if you do some boxing, and if you, do, if you are taking care of reachability, if an attacker, a user, can control the shape of a compile method with what I just showed you, this attacker can execute arbitrary assembly code. So some boxing and reachability by themselves are not enough if the VM lets you go around all these measures, okay? Uh, another way to escape digital VM, and I'm going to go fast through it. Um, let me first close this one. Questions? So, oh. Oh, okay. Okay, I'm not going to show you this one. If you want to see it, uh, download Isuk Talk. The video is out there and it's very good. And I want to go something else. At least one more, I hope. Yeah, I always have this problem. So, we kept going. There are more ways. I can arbitrarily access any memory, read and write. And, uh, but I want to go further. I want to understand, actually. I already saw a few examples that it's possible to break the VM, but now I want to understand the VM. So I want to actually go a little, bit, a little bit further, see what's going on, not just uh, run away and uh, close it. So we started reversing to understand we started understanding how every bytecode is translated into assembly. Okay? So the push R is translated as push EAX. And what... Oh, I, you won't see the sources, but I think it's okay. What better way to understand and document something than the small talk itself? And, of course, if you don't have sources, it's not good, right? But let me... Well, let me just show you this. I, I went through every bytecode, okay, in the VM, and re-implemented, re-implemented it, actually re-implemented it so it works. For example, the push R is a push R. That's easy, but, okay, we have a an option called Assembler, and after we finish implementing every bytecode, we wanted to see if it was good or not, so we actually, actually while we were reversing it, documenting it, we wrote a bunch of tests, okay, and so what do these tests do? They actually nativize a method with the original shit and nativize it with the small talk shit and compare the bytes and compare a lot more things. So we have, well, there you can see 600, uh, we don't have sources again, but we have lots of methods and each of these methods is translated in both ways and compare, okay? 
But this test, remember, I want to understand it all, so I want to have a good representation of what it actually is. These tests are a little bit more than... Well, these tests are actually only testing the shape of the output. So if I actually wanted to change how one bytecode is implemented, I won't be able to use these tests anymore because the assembly would change. Okay? And now that we have every bytecode implemented in Smalltalk, we have pretty much a shit implemented in Smalltalk. We have a just in time Smalltalk compiler implemented in Smalltalk. And we want to go farther. We, we saw, okay, this is a lot of things. This is very interesting. We want to go further. We want to actually see if we want, we, we can implement the whole VM in Smalltalk. Or at least just the nativizer, the sheet in Smalltalk, but use it. So, I think, yeah, green. Um, let me, so we said, okay, we want to test this code and see if it actually works. I won't have time to do this. Uh, this is not really good. I will just talk about it. Or, show it? What should I do? Um, here, you can see that everything I'm doing, or, okay. What I did is I changed the original VM to call back into Smalltalk every time the VM is nativizing a method. Okay? So every time a new method is com trans translated into assembly, I get a call back into my Smalltalk message over here. And here, well, it's not good, but you can see I'm... What it, so far, there's no difference. Okay. okay. So far, I'm only... Okay, let's... Same. Yes, it generates the same, but... Yes, but, for example, uh, if I won't have sources, I won't be able to do this. <sighs> I hate it. No, 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 pero voy a hacer otra cosa. No, pero, pero sí. Bueno. Okay, now we have sources. Okay. I have my backup. Yeah, so I was showing this. What I did is hook or intercept the VM to call me back to call Smalltalk when it's going to nativize the method. And here, here it's what's going to call. Um, it's going to show in the transcript that it got the callback for this compiled method, okay, it means that it was going to nativize that method. Let me, I'm going to show you more than this, but, so here I install it. And if I move around, every time something's nativized, we're going to see a message there. So if I press, I like this example, I always do the same. If I press the arrow down, we see cursor down key input and a bunch more. And if I press the arrow up, we only see one because the cache has already some methods in it. And now if I move, we don't see anything else because these methods are already nativized. Okay, so I'm getting a call every time the VM needs to compile something. If I move right, I get again a message, but not anymore. If I move left, I get it again. Okay, so... Let me remove this and show you again this. But this callback, it's a small talk, so I could do whatever I want. For example, I could open a window every time a message is compiled, or save it to a file, or whatever. Or, for example, if the selector of the compile method is test the thing, 
I can nativize it with my nativizer, with the Smalltalk nativizer. Okay? So that means that this new method is going to be used, executed with my nativ nativizer. So let's again install this. Let me clear that. Um, and now if I flush, this is forcing a full GZ and a full cold cache flush. Uh, so everything was renativized, okay? And now I'm going to, no, I'm going to actually test the thing, call the method. And I do it, and it works. But how do we know it's actually the code we produce it that's used? Let's see. Let me show you this. I'm going to stop the callback just in case. I'm going to um, flush the call cache so we renativize it. And I'm going to change some bytecode. I'm going to change. Let's see what test the thing does. Test the thing just returns. Um, well, let me change load association one, that bytecode, if I can find it. Oh, it's 5A? That's 90. Uh, yes, so I change the assembly here, and I say assembly, assembler breakpoint. And go back to the command, install the callback attached to the process. And we are getting callbacks here, right, in the transcript down there. Things are happening. And I'm going to test the thing. OK, so we actually got a breakpoint. And this should actually be load association one, and then the message sent for new. Um, and I can continue, and it keeps working, okay? This means, first, I'm sure my nativizer is used, and then I can change it from Smalltalk, because I can, for example, selectively choose to compile this particular class with my nativizer, for example, a test class, I can say, OK, I want to run all the tests, but with my nativizer to see, to actually test my nativizer. And in these lines, until you stop me, I will continue. <laughs> um, with this, something else. I'm just going to show you instead of explain it because it's a lot more interesting. We have, ah, it's not here. Don't worry. I always have my backup. We, we had what we call the hybrid method nativizer. This hybrid method nativizer will nativize everything from a compiled method with the original nativizer, with the, the real nativizer, except for one bytecode, the one I want to test. So I tell it, for example, uh, Okay. No, 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 no. Okay. If you see the names, no, you can't. And if I click here, you won't. Okay. This, this methods. I, I like to show you this. Oh. Okay, we have sources again. Very nice. This is how the test looks. The test says, skip load association one. That means nativize everything with the original nativizer except for this bytecode. And this bytecode nativize it with uh, the new nativizer, the smaller one. And then assert object name equal object. Obviously, you should, you should this, you, you expect this to be true always, except if load association fails, right? Like, 
Um, so I test it, and it works, but if I go, for some reason I chose the same example, but it's just by chance. I never used it before. I go and change um, load association, what was it? One? Uh, and I implement index returning two. <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen. And test, and it works, so I return one, or actually three. Ah. And it fails now, or actually gives us an error. But it's because I changed that particular bytecode, right? So it means it is actually working and testing that. And I wish I could go further, because what's next is amazing. But I don't know, do, do we have any more time? Uh, any questions? How much time do you need? I need five minutes to talk, but I don't know if you'll get it. <laughs> so, okay. What 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 do we want to do now? What Right. <laughs> that works. Thank you. So So where do we want to go now? Okay. As Andres told me when he saw the presentation at the ISUG, he said, but wait a second. You have a full native ISER. You can probably do part of the VM with that. And we said, yeah, we could. Let's see if we can do it. Uh, we were actually thinking on that already. but um, So what do we want to do? We want to build a VM from what we have. How? Well, we have something that translates from small talk to native code, to something that's just run on the machine. So our idea is to gather all the methods that are needed to execute the nativizer, put them all, put them all in a list, in a collection, and nativize them all to get, <coughs> sorry, together to an executable file. Okay? We know we can translate them to assembly and to native code. And there are small details, of course. It's not exactly the same to build one particular native method than to build a collection of native methods that can call each other. And while keeping polymorphism, okay? But we had some ideas. So this is what we don't want to do somehow. The cold freezer, we are calling it the big nativizer. It's a big nativizer. So um, we want to add the methods for assembler, the methods for the bytecode nativizer. The methods for the compile method nativizer, we tell it the native entry point to all this blob, blob of code is the, the, the selector for the entry point is RT compile, whatever. And we save it in a DLL. And it's a dream, right? But let me show you, if I can, this, at least the source code for this test. It says uh, here, big nativizer new methods column methods. And the methods is an array with the actual method I want to test, because this is a test case. Um, is nil for undefined object, is nil for object, is undefined value for undefined object, and not for true and false. And we write all that into one big file, a DLL, an executable file. And this test goes further than that 
it actually runs the compile method using this library. Okay? What what this function, what this, sorry, what this method is going to do, well, there are some uh, indirect, uh, I want to show you. It, it's, gonna, it's going to load the DLL into memory. Yes, yes, sorry. It's going to load the, the DLL into memory and uh, get the entry point. Let me do something else. Actually, so let me rewind a little bit so I can show you something. So I said I'm going to freeze a bunch of codes, a bunch of methods into a big native executable file, and I want to keep polymorphism working. We want we want we want that. We don't want to write C in in Smalltalk. We want to have Smalltalk in Smalltalk. So, but. Since we are writing all the code that's there, we don't have lookup. Okay? So, how do we do that? Let me show you a little bit how a native method looks. Um, the first thing a native method does is compare the class of the receiver. You can read that over there. Compare the class of the receiver, of the actual receiver, the current receiver, with the class of the method that was used, of the compile method that was used to nativize this code, okay? If the class of the receiver is not the, the actual class of the compile method, we need a lookup for some reason. We need a lookup. We need to find the actual method that we need to use. But if it's the right class, we can go ahead and execute the code that's under there, okay? And every native method had this. So we had this idea. What happens if I compile all the methods I want to use, and I group them by selector, and I chain the class checks for all these native methods in this fashion? When the class check fails, instead of forcing a lookup, I jump to the next class check. One of them is going to work because, presumably, I nativize everything I need. So one of them is going to work. And in the worst case, maybe because I want it to be dynamic and to be able to add stuff at the runtime, at the end of this chain, I actually do a lookup. But in the normal case, one of them is going to work. So this is what we're doing. We are collecting a bunch of methods, grouping them by selector, nativizing all them into DLL, and chaining the class checks for the native methods, and creating one single DLL with everything in it. I have a sure. Shouldn't you use this kind of class? No. Yes, that, that's right, and that's the problem we are his question is if we should be using is kind of instead of class. Is kind of is not actually the answer because subclasses can re-implement the method and I want a different implementation for subclasses. But yes, we need to care about the hierarchy because one method is implemented in one particular class but it's used in subclasses. So we should do something about it. The simplest and most naive idea is to put a class check for every class that may use this method once in its lifetime. I don't know. That's the most native thing that's going to work. A better approach is to actually implement some lookup at the end. This lookup can be implemented in Smalltalk. And then when the lookup is required, we can patch the chain to add one more class check at the end. That's our idea. But yes, that's true. Uh, so somebody's actually paying attention. Um, so we have a bunch of tests here uh, for the big nativizer. For example, uh, this one will test the simple polymorphic export, no inheritance test. So let's see what that is. 
simply polymorphism, no inheritance test. Is this weird code? It's saying true, not. If false, false, not. If true, true. If false, false. If true, false. What's interesting about this code is that it's complicated while still using one selector, not. And two polymorphic classes, true and false. So this will only work if polymorphism is actually working. Okay? Well, that's Javier's twisted mind sitting there who did it. Yeah, it took me a while to read it. He's, he, he's who implemented most of this, this part of not devising everything into one DLL, and it was a big effort, particularly because DLLs are a complex piece to write. <laughs> And because then, after you have that, then it's not easy what you have to do. It's not only that. Okay, the test, this doesn't really mean nothing, but the test, the test works. Um, yes. But, yeah. Let me, I had it open, but for some reason it went away. Let me... Let me open the DLL and show you how the code looks like in it, a little bit, because, I don't know, so you can see I'm not lying. Um, it went away, right. I don't want, what I want to do is, don't remove the file at the end, then run the test. Oops, it crashes, so we go home. <laughs> I think it crashed. I don't know. Yes, it did. Uh. Any questions? I can answer questions while typing, sometimes. <laughs> no questions? I don't see your hands. That I can do. Yes. Yes. Well, that's a very interesting question. No, no. Well, our idea, our idea is to have always a backup nativizer that we can uh, use when we fall in a recursion. In this case, we are using the original nativizer. That's part of this small talk. But our idea is to have one advisor that we can use and uh, have that frozen into a DLL and then use that as backup to an, a dynamic nativizer that's actually written in Smalltalk, completely written in Smalltalk, not frozen. But we still don't know if it's possible, right? It's just ideas so far. So this particular DLL has many exports. For example, it has true, not, and it has false, not. The font bigger? Uh, ah, yes, I learned that today. How was that? No, I can't. I did it today. How did I do it? Como lo hice? Como hice, Dave? Bueno, viste? This is soon. Oh, sorry. So, era ventanita, bueno, sí, no sé. Bueno, no. Anyway, uh, you you can't see it. I'm sorry, but ¿se ve? So we have for for not we have true, not false, not and not. Not is just a selector, and it's actually the chain of checks. This is checking that the receiver has this particular, let me say class, it's not actually class in this small talk, it's the method dictionary, right? But let me just call it class. And if it's the class, if, if it's that class, it jumps there, and it jumps here, and this is part of true not. But if it's this other class, it jumps here, 
and this is part of false not. And it's not jumping to the first byte of the function, because the function also has a class check itself. And since we already checked the class, we are just skipping it. Okay? So here we have uh, a VLL that was built coding in Smalltalk, like in real Smalltalk. Uh, well, kind of probably uh, a little bit uh, crazy Smalltalk, if you will let me say it. But it's a still Smalltalk. It was nativized with everything that it needed to run to a DLL, and it just runs. And at the same time, we have the nativizer written in Smalltalk. You put the two things together, right? So we want to write a VM in Smalltalk itself. We are not sure if we want, we're going to be able to do it, but we want to write the lookup, the nativizer, the garbage collector, maybe some primitives, although after seeing Andres presentation, I will probably think about it again. But we want to write it all in small talk. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.